Hey, I uh, apologize for being late. Uh, I had a previous session that went a little bit over time, so I'll try not to do that again in the future. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Was I coming through or Perfect. was it inaudible? No, I just want to know Tanner, we can I hear can you. Be heard. Tanner, we I, can I hear you me. well. Sam, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, let's see, Doug, I'm swinging over rights here. Okay, perfect. And I'm going to go deal with the puppy right now. No worries. I'm just posting reminders. I un unblocked my audio, so the audio is unblocked. <laughs> Well, at least we've got one, one check mark for the belt for today, huh? <laughs> I'm going to be right back. I'm just going to grab some Kleenex. Oh, you're doing that, Heiner. May I inform you of one thing? Next Saturday yes. in uh, Barn Raising, yes. Kayla will lead us to focus on the topic of Tanaloa Dialogue. So yes. uh, two weeks ago or last week, you had expressed an interest in that. So I just wanted to place that reminder in you for next Barn Raising. There she is. She had told me it's in my calendar. Yeah. And I was just talking about you, Kayla. Hi. <laughs> How are you guys doing? I am uh, <laughs> great, other than that I only got about three hours sleep. So if I'm groggy and senseless, then that's why. I had about three hours sleep yesterday and then tried to have some more sleep this afternoon, but couldn't lay down to rest, but couldn't get to sleep. So I woke up again, started doing some work on the computer. I'm still groggy from my trip. <laughs> Einer, where is your uh, locale? Is that your yard? That is uh, the Sarajevo. It's a Bosnian restaurant in my neighborhood in the green. And I'm having someone coming here to pick me up. But presently I have my weekend lamb. That's a grill lamb of a whole piece of lamb. And my friend is always doing it for his friends Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, cool. So. Bon appetit. Hey, has Berlin more or less opened up or are they still more or less on uh, restricted uh, guidelines? Well, we have semi-restricted guidelines. But when we are here in the green, in something like a beer garden, then it is just that people should not sit close together. Mm -hmm and normally not more from more than two households and typically not more of four or six people. And yeah. if we take two meters between us, no problem. Mm -hmm. And the waiters have to come with mask. Yeah. Yeah, most of the restaurants here have more or less opened up at least you know, half uh, their schedule uh, for distant you know, tables. Uh, but it's starting to happen again and at least in Seattle, I don't know what the numbers are, but I heard in Texas, they have record numbers of infections now, uh, probably after the uh, protests. But I think in my mind, it's a tough call because I think those protests were necessary. So it's kind of hard to live in these times. If we're not clear about what it is we're trying to live for.
So let me go get my puppy. Actually, before I uh, go get my puppy, I want to show you my black puppy. <laughs> Is that a he or a she? This is Lucifer. He will be, he's 11, he's gonna turn 12 this year. Have you got any um, video of the Lucifer interacting with the puppies? Uh, I would love to share one with you. Um, actually, let me share a really, really old one back when Lucifer was a baby and I'll, I'll find some others later. Hang on one second. It's interesting how older, mature cats respond to young puppies. Well, first, I think uh, because it's so um, fun for me, I'm going to share one where the cat was young and I had an older dog. Hang on one second. You're up against about 65 million videos on YouTube. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cat videos. <laughs> Cat videos, by far the majority programming of the internet. We're the new Egyptians, right? We worship our cats? Yeah. Absolutely. I like cats. I'm just allergic to them. It's not worth the trade-off of perpetual misery to have one. What's the matter, Kayla? You look perturbed. <laughs> I thought I had granola. Ah. I, I want to eat it with my yogurt. Granola I, interruptus, huh? <laughs> so I'm just like, but then again, I rearranged everything, so. You can crush up, crush up some cornflakes. I don't even have that. Oh, well. Jazz, I can't tell whether the look is like holy man or whether it's um, terrorist mugshot. <laughs> so Alex, in response to your question, here's a video of when Lucifer was a baby and he was pestering my second golden retriever named Angel. Short video. I'll find another one where he's adult dealing with the little baby, the baby golden. Oh, nice, nice piano music in the background. Crazy. Toward the end there, uh, it's really funny, but uh, I'll leave it for you to see. Is that Zeus? No, that is uh, Zeus's older sister, Angel. Not related, but you know, I had Angel, and then when Angel was about six or seven or eight, that's when I got Zeus. 
Angel eventually um, lived to be 16, uh, strangely. Wow. But that's Zeus, old, unfortunately, that's old, old for a golden, isn't it? It's very old for a golden, but that's because uh, Angel was half golden, half Australian shepherd, but ah. she looked 95% golden. <laughs> anyway, at the end there, uh, Lucifer attacks uh, Angel and bounces off her face. See, the reason I shared that one and not the others is most of the good videos recently where the puppies are dealing with an adult uh, Lucifer are on my daughter's phone. So I have to go get uh, those videos from my daughter's phone before I share them. The razor sharp, they're little kittens with their claws. So they should, the uh, worst thing to have when they're in a, when they're playful, they think they're playing, but the pain those claws cause not worth it. Actually, you know, if we're waiting for people to gather, may I share a short story about how Lucifer entered my life? I take Tai Chi, and normally I go to Tai Chi lessons. You know, when I was doing this, I was going once a week and practicing five or six days a week, so very regular. And one week, I had missed my class in Cupertino, and my instructor teaches at four or five different cities throughout the week. So that Saturday, I went to Palo Alto, which is another one of his uh, martial arts studios. So when I went to this class, there were only two students and the instructor. as myself, another student, in a very large, uh, you know, workout room. Um, so we did the forms. And at the end of the class, after the end of my form, I ended, and we normally close with a bow. And as I bowed, I saw this little kitten who was about the size of my palm, black, okay, between my feet central, smack 50-50, right between my feet, you know? And I thought, this is strange because he clearly had to have dragged himself or crawled onto the floor mat, and this was like 30 feet from the floor, okay? I don't know how he could have got there. And if I'd been a little bit off, I would have stepped on him. He would have died. He was like within like a day or two of birth. His eyes were still glued shut. His bones were like razor blades. They were so small, so sharp and clearly had not been fed in quite a while, could not have the strength to climb out of a paper bag. So I put him in a paper bag, took him to the vet two straight days, and now he's a 15 pound cat. He's 11 years old now. But I have still today no idea how he got there to be right between my feet and I was standing above him after this Tai Chi class. Still no idea. So he picked me out, he adopted me. They cat adopted you sight unseen. Literally, literally. It took days for those eyes to get unglued. Yeah, so he has a lot of sneezing fits now, but that's about the only symptom I see of uh, his health. Otherwise, he's a 15-pound, pretty robust cat and completely comfortable with the dogs. I'm probably taking way more time than necessary for checking. Cola, you got a camera going? I could observe. I think Colin has a preference for not turning on his camera. So is nonconformity the mother of all rebellion? Not the mother. There's something beyond that.
there seems to be a group of people who like to get out and protest, even if they don't, even though they don't know what the issues are. <laughs> but then there's the um, dedicated, the dedicated people who have a being honour. Uh, politics or religion or human human rights, world health organization. Creativity instead of non conformity. Creativity is basically of coming up with new ideas. Necessity is the mother of invention. There's one for Jess Winder. I was watching a video of the space walk, astronauts outside the space station, and the, the soundtrack, the soundtrack, I could have sworn it was wind, you know, like in a wind tunnel on the microphone. <laughs> and that's, up in space, so I, th I put a comment in there. I think I don't think NASA appreciated it. Hi, <laughs> are you unmuted for a reason? I assume. <coughs> If you mention the flat earth on the NASA page, your comment won't go through. <laughs> you mean they have an idiot filter? Yeah, the world could use one of those. They could calibrate it by setting it, by, by training it on our president. <laughs> Somebody's breaking up. Who's trying to say something and getting interrupted by technology? So, who's got a block? I don't got a block, but I got something to say about the idiot filter. You do? Feel free. Okay. Well, I think the best idiot filter or the, the most effective one is yourself by learning. And uh, to that aim, tried to uh, practice some of what I talk about. And last week I listened for about an hour and a half before you called on me. And then I thought that gave me the right to talk for 10 minutes, apparently. I thought I talked for 15 minutes, but when I played it, when I looked over the transcript, I realized that it was a bit of a conversation until I got going for the last 10 minutes. Anyway, I figured that if it's something worth saying, it should be something worth trying to uh, edit, harvest, and review. Um, like to be more focused, I guess. If it's just a com casual conversation, then maybe not so much. But it wasn't really casual conversation. It was about Kaepernick and about the suffragette movement and about the game of discernment and the Dickopedia and our chain. So I went back and I edited it so that it was actually legible because the raw notes as they are can be quite horrendous if you're somebody, a speaker like me that jumps around and uses different unprepared speech. <laughs> so to make a long story short, I think I filtered myself uh, for the future thinking about what I've said in the past and and what I might be responsible for having to edit if I do say it. Um, thinking that I am responsible to clean up the text in the transcript. If you speak a lot, you got a lot of text to clean up. And then you realize, was that really necessary? Or how do I write text more succinctly and, and, and concise than I actually speak? It's quite a difference. So anyway, that was quite a relevation to see how many times I said not, 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 like three times in a row, stuttering and different things. But anyway, yeah, I just thought the, the best filters yourself, I think.
So what did the 10 minutes end up boiling down to just, just by the by? Well, you can go have a look at the document, see what you think. Um, I put some pictures in there and ma it made it, you know, kind of, what I did is I broke it out so it wouldn't just be like time, partial sentence, time, partial sentence, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a row after row. I just took the beginning time and edited the text so that it's actually legible. Put square brackets in where there should have been words and, you know, uh, just, you know, made it useful in a sense as an exercise. You know, why did I spend so much time talking about this? And I guess the reason why is because it took so long and there was many things to comment on but I didn't have any notes. And I just, I just noticed generally how much better it is when you're conscious of what you're saying and how long you're speaking. I think, I think Heiner would be glad to hear things like that too. He's an advocate of passing the talking stick. Anyway, thanks. So may I add a note? My note is, um, that's one of the reasons I make that document available is so that, you know, it can go, anyone can go back and clean it up and make it uh, easier to consume. I do recommend though, that uh, you did add a lot of material, Colin, that was not actually part of the conversation. So, you know, in trying to keep the record uh, true to the actual event, I was wondering whether or not you find it of value to link to another document perhaps, perhaps a blog or perhaps, you know, even a, an essay and include some of the suffragette movement, the Wikipedia articles that you included, uh, some of that. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, how uh, that might actually be part of the group, group uh, memory because, I mean, I, I think it's wonderful that you went back and edited it. So don't uh, take this as criticism at all. I'm just trying to see how can we create the best value out of it so that we know what this is and we know what your thoughts are and your thoughts you know, might actually be an amalgamation of other content from other places as well. Uh, so that might be worth creating as a standalone uh, uh, document or you know, notes itself. So I'm, I'm experimenting with these ideas. These obviously are Engelbartian kind of ideas that I haven't yet truly uh, introduced to the group because very few people have actually gone back to that document and edited it. You're probably one of the very first, Colin. So I want to at least acknowledge and rec uh, recognize that and just, you know, figure out how we might be able to make more value out of your contributions. Over. Right. Well, I did, I did consider how much I was putting in and I think I only added the relevance to the conversation if somebody didn't want to go link and if they wanted more data I think I put links to go get more data. Uh, the suffragette movement I think was one of the largest inclusions because I took the first paragraph or so but just where they were discussing the dates that the women were able to vote and I did that because it was germane to the fact that I was saying I didn't know when and there was quite a large gap between the different locations and when they uh, got the privilege. Um, so yeah, I do agree with that. And I think it's sort of like um, a once over edit to make it, um, you know, everything kind of makes sense because reading it, it was, it was impossible to make sense, especially with the errors in the translations. Um, you know, words that weren't even spoken. You know, you, you know as well as I do that the, the text translation can be difficult if you don't speak clearly. So it's important for everybody to speak clearly. <laughs> but yeah, I think I, I balanced that off. And if it was of any value and worth taking forward, like if what I said actually had value, then I would think it would grow in some way beyond the document. But I left it at a state that anybody reading it wouldn't have to go anywhere to get the gist of what I was trying to say. Try nothing more, just, just as much as possible. If you think there was too much there, then yeah, that's, that's probably not something somebody want to do. If you have a lot to say about something, which if it's important, you probably may, then perhaps you should build off uh, another document. And we have several in the community and I don't know um, how we can uh, bring importance to each, each other's point, but I, I do think it's starting to happen as you were saying in barn raising and I'll leave that for you to speak about. And if you have anything you wanna share about that, this is unblocking, but yeah, thank you, Sam. I've got a, a friend who's a, um, Technical, technical writer. He's a 
techni technical troubleshooter and he authors um, books for organizations on the technical side of the manufacturing process or the administrative process or whatever it happens to be. And it's one thing to be able to write like that, but when you're in a com live conversation, you're talking about your story and that makes it interesting for people listening. Without a, a rough copy, you're doing it one-on-one -on -one or one-on-six or one-on-ten and you're doing it live. So you haven't got the chance to go back to the draft and rewrite it like you have with Sam's documents on on Google <coughs> or Glenn's documents. I think Glenn's been contributing a lot too. Which, and Glenn's very good at, he's got a good memory. Very good at summarizing, which is excellent too. I think he takes good notes. I've just installed Microsoft Office Professional and it's given me the ability to do my journaling, archive my journaling online in the in the cloud, in the Google Drive, which is excellent. Not Google Drive, but Microsoft Drive, what do they call it? One box or something. One drive. Yeah. I like the protocol idea, Sam, of that the raw the raw data is the raw data, and that iterative refining or augmentation, for purposes of sort of not just draft control but provenance, in 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 an Engelbardian sense. Very much. Um, that, yeah, the practice would ideally be that somebody copies the notes into a new file? No. I could not more because, seriously. Because if, if they start embedding links in the original file, then you are having hops. If you go to an original fi new file and just do augmentations, then you are a link away from the original. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I get the, I get the idea of not duplicating data uh, in service to efficiency of total bits and bytes. But um, I could project a future day state where it would be easier to eliminate redundancy and replace with embedded links that automatically are evoked. But I don't know whether we have that capability today. Well, I'm even wondering about the value of revocation because uh, an Engelbartian idea is number one, nothing gets deleted. If it happened, it happened, you know? Right. And the idea is, um, the I've spoken about it before, derivative works. So clearly you can add value to things and link, you know, if you like, and that is useful. And provenance, what you mentioned, or I sometimes call it epistemology, you know, um, is clearly what we're trying to go for. So one of my other requests to Colin, which I don't know if I shared there or someplace else, was to please do it. Uh, I mean, it's not a mandatory thing, but I would prefer it. I think it would get more Engelbardian if you did it when you're logged in. You know, right now those edits to the document are made anonymous uh, from the anonymous user. And the again, you know, Colin gets more credit if he actually just logs in and then uh, edits the document. So these are all like Gobartian ideas and we can go forever about those, but that's a quick summary. And there's more. That surprises me, Sam, because I thought I was logged in, but I haven't shared many Google Docs with you. So that's, that's something to <clears throat> think. Yeah, if you go back in there and look at the history, it says Anonymous made this change. It's interesting unpacking that. So there's there's provenance, but there's also attribution, right? So those are two sort of critical data threads, data it's points. Lame. Yeah. 
In fact, it's a point of humor on GitHub, which I've referred to before. GitHub is where software engineers share their work. And the way you look at the history of all the changes down to the most minute detail, the button is called blame. <laughs> Meant humorously, of course. Or not. <laughs> if that gremlin that completely screws you up, like three, good practice. three years down the road from some kernel that somebody embedded that. Uh, well, that's why we have tests. Hmm. Windows 10 just gave an update, security update, because the Wi-Fi service was hacked. That happens frequently. Compromising, compromising millions of computers. So anyone with any juicy blocks I've got something. Please. So with the reopening here in um, Southern California, um, you know, it feels relatively, oops, it feels relatively normal. And that's a good thing. Everybody kind of deserves to feel like they did before, especially if they're very happy. But at the same time, you know, being here in this quarantine, has given me some time to reflect on our values as a society. You know, and in coming back from a vacation, a mini vacation, having to discipline my children about the value of education, um, you know, I, I had to tell my oldest son he can't have his camp out party because he didn't finish his work. Now, some of the work that he had to do was, you know, irrelevant to the overall idea of education. It's just busy work to say that I did this work, which has some of, of importance in and of itself. However, you know, um, I started to think about our values altogether. It's probably better for him to see his friends at this point than it is to finish, you know, this bullshit work that he has to do. You know, but as a parent, I say, well, you didn't do it. These were the expectations. And unfortunately, you can't see your friends now. And then I just kind of started to have a, a deep thinking moment um, as I'm making my lays for people in their graduation and seeing pictures on Instagram. And then I'm thinking, are people, <laughs> you know, it's almost kind of funny how we kind of go back to our same demons, you know, are people wanting to have these lays because they truly care about their children or because they want a picture and a trend? And, um, you know, for me, as far as this, this whole pandemic was concerned and the silver lining is I just kind of got deep into the value systems that we have here in the United States. And if we don't change our values, what truly matters to us, then um, the progression is going to continue to be very, very slow. So circling back to the whole, everything's back to normal, <laughs> you know, it's just things still need to be addressed. You know, the deep rooted things, you know, like education, like health. Um, I'm still not going to bring my kids out and about everywhere until I just feel safe. Everybody deserves to feel safe. Everybody deserves to be healthy. You know, I'm stuck looking for a job. Um, do I want to work myself to death? No. <laughs> I'm enjoying this time with the children. I'm enjoying the slower life. I'm enjoying not wearing makeup. You know, so that's just stuck in my mind. Like, we're going back to the same shit show. It's been, you know can we make these changes? You know, how can we make these changes to where everybody feels safe, 
our values are intact. What are our values? I don't know. This has just been my whole sense of blocking lately. Over. I see that, Sam. Yes. I feel like everything's going to be a fight. <laughs> if you I mean, don't know what thinking if you don't know what our values are it's it's our values are your values and my values and there anything as far as I'm concerned a good value is anything that enables other people to live without hatred and in a environment where there's the quality of opportunity you know, um, equal opportunity so that means they live in, in an unbiased society without racism, without the shackles of uh, economic um, suppression. So That's I'm where they work. Hold on. But Alex, I prefer to make a billion dollars. I prefer that you work for $14 for me. I prefer that you know, all the minions create the wealth that I can go, you know, go buy my yacht with. Those are my values. That's another kind of value. I, I, for me, it's about um, the the essential core in that is what is a product of discretion, choice, and volition as opposed to imprinting programming and social ethnography like mass ethnography and um setting oneself free of the prevailing social order on so many of these fronts um is is sort of required in order to get clarity about how wrong so much of it is. And in your share of your son not doing something that in its essence, based on your description, is arbitrary and meaningless anyway. Um, as a, so what is that? Is that a test? Is that by whose standards in what context a requirement, if it even rationally makes any sense, intrinsically and that trumping him having an opportunity to connect with friends that he may not have seen for the last three months um and um i was having a conversation with somebody about what i'm experiencing which is this heightened heightened sense heightened sense making of things wrong in the way they're related to. And we were talking about um, old paradigm stuff. And, um, and what, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the old energy paradigm, which involved punching holes in the earth. <laughs> um, you know, you wouldn't drill holes in your body. Why would you drill holes in the earth? As opposed to windmills, as opposed to capitalizing on natural flows of water, as opposed to air, as opposed to, you know, all of the, and, and there are so many dimensions of day-to-day -day life in the current paradigm that if you look through that lens, like, does it make sense? And, holding it up to natural processes as the arbiter, as opposed to all of the elaborative frameworks and structures that we've been imposed, we've had imposed on us. If you just sort of measure it against natural processes and say, does this have a correlation to the natural world or not? And if it doesn't, it's probably a bad idea. It probably is doing violence in one way, shape, form or another. It's probably 
creating or attempting to generate or extract a value at the expense of somebody or something else in a destructive or adverse way. And it, that extends into the soft stuff having to do with power over and authority and control and all that. So um, I really think it's worth blank sheeting it. You know, you get to a blank sheet of paper and then really take a look at all of it. And it becomes a lot easier to identify the crap and to say, ah, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not supporting that anymore. <laughs> um, and in the, in the context of my, you know, my wife and I first had a teaser, then took a full program, then ultimately, and I ended up training and teaching at a, a program called um, Redirecting Children's Behavior. And it's basically uh, an approach to nonviolent, non power over uh, parenting. And those, the, what you described would fall into the category of um, logical consequences. Like you set it up and said, do this. If you don't do that, then this is going to be the ramification of that. And you created and constructed a consequence. But it's rare, it's rare as a parent, like I'm a parent, I remember. <laughs> and I was a lot more primitive when I was when I was like actively parenting. Um, so, you know, I look back with horror. But, you know, how many times was my calculus of, of constructing a, 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 a logical consequence as opposed to a natural consequence. Like my kid wants to go out without a coat and it's 10 degrees out. And it's like, that's, you know, natural consequence. You're going to freeze your ass off. And the first time they did that, we had taken the course and we we're like, okay. And, you know, my wife had the coat jammed into a bag she was carrying just in case. And, you know, um, my daughter was freezing to death with blue lips and teeth chattering and all that. And it didn't take her long to learn that, you know, gee, maybe if it's cold out, you want to wear a coat, right? So, um, but in constructing logical consequences, which is something created by parents, <laughs> Reevaluating what the basis is in those, what the criteria is in those, is a values-based inquiry. It's a sort of consciousness awareness-based inquiry. And, you know, um, I can remember times where I constructed perfectly rational, logical consequences in my mind and have my children respond with, fine, I don't care. Like, that's not a consequence for me. So I'm going to continue to do what I want to do. And, and um, that's sort of the story of our world right now, right? Like I get to choose whether I buy a particular product and support a particular company that is doing really fucked up stuff, pardon my French. And I decide whether I burn carbon and overuse or use any more than absolutely necessary the car that's sitting here in front of the house. And all, you know, there are just an infinite number of these decisions. And I also think that there's an internal instinct that gives us a tickle when something's just wrong or when it just doesn't make sense on a felt sensed whole embodied natural order, natural world being level and the life and, and, and culture we're in the majority of things fall into that category. Like you said, you, 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 you're facing going back to work and you like not wearing makeup. And the question begs itself, of course, but in, in the patriarchy, I understand it. Um, you know, but why do you have to wear makeup to go to work? I don't have to wear makeup to go to work. I don't give makeup two thoughts. Doesn't even occur to me. So it's just, all over the place once you start deciding to make choices. That's sort of where I went with that. I'm, I'm complete. Sorry for the length of that. 
Oh, and you brought up a good point because I'm going to go all over the place with this too. Um, so when I was in Sedona, you know, we did these UFO sightings and it, it was beautiful. I love it. I'm into that stuff. Um, and we were talking about um, the, the difference between an airplane and a UFO and the possibilities of the type of energy they use. So then I started thinking about the environment and how, um, you know, when the world was in, on this lockdown, rivers cleared up and the ozone layer repaired itself. I mean, these are values, um, these are natural consequences, much like with my son, well, if, if you do this, this will happen. You know, that it just, it just trips me out how, I mean, majority of society continues to support companies who pollute our air. You know, why can't we find, why can't we have more access to vehicles that are um, self-sustaining as far as fuel is concerned? Why do we have to punch holes in the earth? So it, it just, it, it's just been on my mind. Like we're going back to the same old crap. I mean, why can't we learn from this? Anyway, over. Well, yes, you know, yeah. many are saying, sorry, is this somebody else? No, 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 I was just acknowledging your wave. Go ahead. Yeah, I think there are many who recognize this as an opportunity to not go back to the way we were. But we don't get a chance necessarily to do that if all we care about is to not be hungry or all we care about is to make sure I've got clothes again or my drugs that, you know, keep me alive again. So to be able to think about those things, just like the ability to come here on weekends and spend two hours at a time, is a privilege. It is a luxury. Not everyone has that opportunity. You know, some other people are, you know, occupied 24 hours a day dealing with family, children, health, food, that sort of thing. But it is incumbent, I think, on those who can to create that new normal, not the old normal. And yet there's still people who really succeeded in the old normal that are fighting to keep that and to restore that. And that's what I mean by there's going to be a fight. Because number one, there's a lot of lethargy, not lethargy, but inertia or lack of, you know, uh, bandwidth to consider that and that's a lot of people and then there's the powers that be that control all the resources and the power structures and want that old structure so inside there there's a small sliver of people that say it could be different but it's hard to actually get that voice expressed and to get others to resonate with that because they're being silenced and there's very few of them And they're actively opposed by those in power. Oh, that'll never work. Oh, you've never tried that. Oh, that's unproven. Oh, people are just going to be lazy. Oh, they're just going to sit around on their asses. You know, there's all kinds of arguments that could come up. By the way, uh, I just would prefer, but you know, when we talk about UBI, I don't like the I in UBI. It implies that there's still somebody who's giving you something because something is coming in. It's an income. I prefer to think about universal basic, you know, sustenance or, you know, um, a safety net, you know. But I don't think of it as something where necessarily everybody's going to be beholden to the source that gave me something. Just like the, it's exactly the reason why Trump wanted his names on those $1,200 signatures on checks. He wanted people to think it was coming from him, you know, and certain people probably believe that. That's the citizenry we've got. And that's the manipulation that we face. And now we got, you know, Miller or whatever his name is trying to dismantle Social Security. You think we got riots now, you know? He's actively trying to steal tens of thousands of, not hundreds of thousands of dollars from people who've contributed to, you know, Social Security. That's our money. 
that he's trying to steal. And all that, you know, 500 plus billion dollars is going to the rich that are unaccounted for. They won't talk about who that's going to. I'm again on a rant here. But, you know, the whole notion of creating something new. This is an opportunity. And if we don't do it this time, we better do it the next time a worse virus comes around. This is relatively benign compared to some of the ones that have happened in history. Over, I guess. What is the block, uh, Sam? The block is we don't have a solution yet, and we don't even know how to come up with a solution, and we're being actively opposed in coming up with that solution. And we don't know how to take your contribution, my contribution, Caleb's contribution, Doug's contribution, Alice's contribution, Dishwinder's, and then assemble it into a viable aggregate solution. We don't have collective intelligence, basically. <laughs> Oh, this was such a we is the block. It, there is no we constructed. You speak of a we, but the That's we right. does not exist. That's right. <clears throat> if you take the we out of the equation as a construct, because I'm actually not a big believer in this we concept. I think the minute people go to that extrapolated we, they let themselves off the hook and they no longer have responsibility as a member of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, 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 much more, I'm much more of a believer in the idea of, um, in the context of a group of people that come together in some collaborative endeavor that, um, it does there there aren't any extrapolations to the group there's maintaining a recognition that it's a co-created result of every individual contribution being aggregated and so it's all about my con contribution am i contributing or not do i have a value to contribute or not in service to um, an external greater perceived whole or commons or not. And that that lens does have a way of leveling up individual awareness, consciousness, responsibility, accountability, all of those things. Um, but the minute we put a stake in the ground and have a quote organization or some abstracted aggregate construct like a we, every individual is all of a sudden breathes a deep sigh of relief because they're no longer responsible for what's being created. They're just along for the ride. I formally object. <laughs> so I agree with everything you said about individual contribution. That does not uh, in any way change but there's still a value in what we can create together. And it's more than just the sum of the individual parts. There is a uh, effects of scale that can apply if we choose to do so. And I think to ignore that is to reduce our capacity to do anything strategic pretty much. I, I didn't suggest ignoring aggregate produced generated, generated benefit, you're suggesting that my allergic reaction to we constructs is an allergic reaction to collective output. It isn't. It's the personification of the we. It's extrapolating that aggregate output as if it becomes a thing unto itself. Okay, so I would... Which, which it's that personification piece I have a big objection to. So I, I don't think I was complete because your statement about everybody saying, oh, now I'm absolved of responsibility, I think disrespects individuals and thinks of them as less than they could be. In other words, you think that they're so quick 
to give up that sense of responsibility to act on their own if there is a we. I heard that in what you said. Now, if that's not what I heard, then please correct me. But I did. I, I, yeah, I think I, I think that is. I think that's a fair. That's a fair framing. I, I think it's the way I see it. Though is it's not a disrespecting of individuals. It's that. It's that there's a cultural imprinting, training, and programming that that prevails today, where. I was, I was, I'm not anymore, thank God, but I was trained to switch into subservient mode in the, within the context of some kind of projected we construction. Like the minute it became a construction of something that I was just a part of, just a piece of the machinery of, just a commodity within, think current cultural frame around work, that I switch into the subservient, you know, wh where and when do you want me to jump and how high? And that that's a psychological, emotional, brainwashing, imprinting programming that's endemic to the cultural frame we're in. And, and um, it's the way we're, it's the way the bulk of us as a species have been made subservient in the current system. And, and I don't, blame people for suffering under that yoke. My interest is in helping set others free from it and reconnect with their agency, their authority, their power, their ability to affect change or not play, not invite it to the party or not accept it being imposed on them. So it's not coming from a place of disrespect, but it is coming from a recognition of the existing social order that you know has 45 million people supporting Donald Trump because they were sort of programmed and set up to be susceptible to him. Um, and I don't blame those people for falling for the, for the horror that he represents. They were set up by the prevailing culture to, to invite it and celebrate it. And they don't have to, they have choice. I got too much to say, but Alex has his hand up. When I think about how I am going to contribute, when I'm out, when I'm put on the spot, I I, I opt out. I cop get the cop out because I say what I'm going to do is suggest what we should do. <laughs> you know, but it's the thing is, um, there is a there is a collective effort happening. And that is because some of us decided that we should pull our fingers out. And that resulted in <coughs> the continuation of some commitments made. And uh, it's interesting to see how things are evolving. And it's, it's also painfully slow. So it's another aspect that needs attention somewhere along the line. You know, when I don't believe in discipline for children when they're acting up. Uh, education and training is more important than discipline, I think. But sometimes children go wild and run on the road. What do you do? You know, um, a smack on the bottom because kids are going to get killed if they run on the road. That's a dangerous thing to do, and if they don't understand the, the lesson that you say, please don't run on the road, and they continually do it, I mean, you've got an issue there to deal with. So a smack on the bottom might not be the best avenue. It might be uh, against a lot of people's principles and values. But I, gee, I wish, I wish mum, my mum had a smack me on the bum and more often. Over. Go ahead, Sam. I can see the smoke coming out of your ears. <laughs> Actually, I just, uh, be uh, less pokey and address this parenting issue that I heard uh, Kayla and Alex uh, mention. And I'll get back to what you just said, Doug, hopefully, you know, at some point. 
Um, Alex, it's interesting you said that because my son, after he grew up and you know went to college and became an art major, he said, I wish, he, this is Nick saying, he said, I wish you, dad, talking to me, I wish you had been harder on us. I wish you had spanked us more. I wish you had not let me become an art major. <laughs> and uh, the story about that one is that when he was a junior in college, three years into college, some of you may have heard this story, uh, and all of his friends were getting like business internships and software engineering internships and, you know, legal internships and that sort of thing. And he's sitting there with a, you know, art uh, set of classes saying, you know, what internship am I going to get, you know? And I was hoping that he would come with that question when uh, he declared art. So at that moment, I said, Nick, you know, if you agree to go to school for one more year, I'll pay for one more year, but consider a STEM or business minor. So he actually chose computer science, went five full years and did not just a minor, but he did a full major in computer science. And now he's working as a software engineer. Now, you could criticize that as saying that's playing along in the old system. It's the old industrial complex, you know, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, he needs to feed himself and I can't afford to feed him, you know, and extrapolate all that, right? So now he recognizes that, yeah, I did basically lose all cred as an Asian parent when I let him declare art as a major. <laughs> but... If I forced him to choose something else, you know, he would have hated me, he would have hated that, you know, he wouldn't have come to that realization himself. So now he regularly asks me for, you know, work and life and other kind of advice. He just did that this past week. He spent three sessions of over 45 minutes of him deciding, you know, what team he's going to join at his new company. They're giving him a choice. So on the parenting front, there is that fine line between what you have to do to keep your kids safe and alive versus letting them feel empowered and with choices. And, you know, Doug, you talked about this. Give them that choice, right? As you were speaking, Kayla, I was thinking, okay, would it have been possible and would it have been attractive to you to say, okay, fine, you know, go spend this time with your friends, but you agree to do this thing later. Will you promise to do that? whatever that is, the discipline, you know, the, the bullshit, you know, the busy work, you know, if it didn't have, you know, bad consequences and you could actually achieve both, that might've been way, I don't know your situation. I'm just uh, trying to figure this out. Okay. Because giving kids choices is a way of letting them know they've got some power in their life. And yeah, you guys have all been through this kind of parental training. So, you know, you still get them to do, you know, X, but split it into X1 or X2, you know, so you still get X. <laughs> And you're still avoiding Y over there, but you're still giving them that, that, that choice. And with people, it's very much the same way. We're being manipulated exactly the same way. We think we have Democrats and Republicans and we think we have a choice. That's bullshit, okay? If you haven't seen through that already, you know, that's the result of our very effective educational system keeping you dumbed down. We don't have that choice. And the fact that we have this stupid two-party system, we have to think, oh, I got to choose the lesser of two evils. Ah, oh, man, you know, people still believe that. And that's why we can't have new societies and new things and nice things and new nice societies, okay? Because we've been so manipulated to think that we have choice, but we bleep and don't. And until we recognize it and until we rise up and actually overthrow the powers, it's still gonna be the same. So despite COVID, I was actually quite supportive of the protests and demonstrations. I knew, however, that every single opportunity, there's gonna be that uh, false flag uh, element that's gonna be the you know, white narcissists or white supremacists coming in, you know, stacking up bricks and you know, uh, smashing in windows and setting fires and overturning cars. I've not yet seen a picture where protesters actually have been doing that. I have seen videos of people dressed in black, Caucasian, by the way, smashing in windows at Target. But if there were more looting actually being done by protesters, don't you think those videos would have been caught? 
So there's a whole narrative of, oh, protests are, you know, violent, so therefore we're going to clamp down on bullshit. That's the powers manipulating. Hey, Stacia. Manipulating the, the opportunity, yeah, right? Didn't, didn't some stupid politician, not stupid, very brilliant, by the way, say, never let a crisis, you know, go to waste? Gee, boy, we don't even see it. And it's being done very effectively. And all our rights are being, therefore, whittled away because, oh, we have to protect the people because protests are violent. We have to put curfews in place. Shut me up, okay? Just shut me up. I could go on forever. So adding to that, I believe we have to own up to our mistakes, period. We, as a society, have to say we are being manipulated and we bought into it. We, you know, acted this way and, and that's it. That's the only way, in my opinion. You know, same with my kid, who I gave two weeks, by the way. <laughs> he had two weeks to complete it. So that's very gracious of me. And my, um, he has to own up and say, you know, I just blatantly didn't do this. You know, right now he's pouting. Yeah. Right now, it wasn't important to me, mom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right now America's pouting. You know, it's just how can we create a space for people to feel safe to say, I screwed up. With that, I'm complete. Well, given an opportunity, I'll just state again that I wrote a blog yesterday or the day before denouncing the state of our educational system because that's what produced the population that gave us an electorate that put Trump in office and, oh, by the way, isn't really pursuing the election rigging if indeed there was election rigging because we've got a you know, whole uh, corrupt system here that managed to insert itself into power. Over. Actually, so let me not be so negative. Let me on the positive side say, I actually am inspired by people creating connections and really sharing some concern and some energy and some ideas and some potential nuggets of solution. I just wonder whether we're going to be in time and whether we're going to be effective enough. Okay. I wonder whether or not we're going to be, you know, that council of elders sitting around on Easter Island as the last tree gets chopped out. Over. You're focusing on the USA, but uh, a Dutch uh, female writer has interviewed 100 women in the Saudi Arabia. She is Arabist, so she knows Arabic. So she has written a book. She's published it in Dutch. So I, fa I found it, the, the summary. I made an English translation of it. And I sent the English translation of that book, so the, the summary, to a professor at the Yazan University in Saudi Arabia. So then it goes to the females in Saudi Arabia. And it's a summary of a book. Uh, about 100 women interviewed in Saudi Arabia. So, completely different setting, and uh, it's what you asked for. What can we do to improve the planet? Over. I, I really believe in that.
I, you know, I believe that um, every single one of us, all 8 billion, any one of us has the intrinsic capacity to completely put the world on its head to turn things upside down, inside out, and, and to the better, or to the worse, but hopefully to the better, uh, myself included. And, and the only sort of question is, you know, um, the only limitation on that is one self-imposed that says, if I hold the belief that I can't, I won't. That's, I'm guaranteed to get exactly what I asked for. But if I believe reforestation has a major role to play, and I have a vision for how to approach that, that in, creates a mechanism for private capital to fuel it at scale and at speed required. And I see a Manhattan Project group of 20 to 30 key stakeholders with pieces of the puzzle that need to be brought to bear to create a complex systemic solution on a global basis, allowing for local differences. Um, and, and I want to convene that round table as the kickoff for a Manhattan Project type undertaking around this refor reinfor reforestation vision. Um, I can do that. And, and, and I, there's a partner in New Zealand named Dave Tech Smith, who some of you know, who's in that with me. And he believes we can do that. And we've been gathering pieces and identifying people and having conversations and poking the bear with money people and defining and extrapolating in our mind what is the kind of source from a capital standpoint that's required for the seed part of that, which is, you know, the half a million, a million dollars just to convene everybody at the same place, at the same time from all over the world for a two week initial block scrum to get everybody on boarded and on the same page and, and underwrite that and underwrite the individuals at whatever levels they need to see money to show up and all that. And um, I don't have, any, there's no higher authority or reality external to me out there that says I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's just the truth of it. And that's the truth of it for anybody else that has a, a, an idea, even if it's, a, it doesn't matter whether it's a big idea or whether it's a small idea. Why do you speak of a Manhattan project? I'm connected with uh, Mubarak in Mombasa, planting mangroves in Tudor Creek. He doesn't get money from me. I connect him with uh, other people with that knowledge. Yeah, so when absolutely. I knowledge about, about mangrove planting, he thought I was a professor of mangrove planting, but I got interested in mangroves. I found him and said all the information I got that's, to him, and I'm still connected. That's it's not a Manhattan a, project. That, well, it's a Manhattan project. It's there, me. There, there, it's correct. Uh, uh, understood. There, there's, there's micro value, intrinsic value in a micro relationship and, 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 and endeavor like that. And there's value in attempting to come up with a global and, and enabled larger game plan to sustain the people that are working on the ground. So I'm, I'm just coming at it from a scaling inquiry, like how can I, generate, you know, instead of an Eden, you know, forestry projects, which is the, the top on the ground or, you know, NGO devoted to reforestation, right? Instead of them sucking air for funding or being tortured by one backer, I'm trying to figure out how do I give them a couple of billion dollars for them to scale up and to expand their stewardship around the world on local and indigenous levels, right? So I don't discount what you just described and the value of that. That, that was my point. 
at any value in any scale, any one individual can be of value and service and contribute. And there are no limits. There are no constraints. And there's no value judgment that says, because I'm thinking of a scaling thing, that that's better than what you're doing one-on-one -on -one with somebody who's actually putting mangroves in the ground or water, whichever. And I'm a huge mangrove fan, by the way. And uh, he is My favorite going trip. to connect globally. He is going to be able to connect himself globally. I'm serious. Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. helping. Tell me. So he is, he is part of another group already. And he is, uh, so he is an, uh, I will call it a restoration camp now. So I, I made him notice that group. And now it's an official restoration camp. So he, he gets the large, uh, larger idea. And I want to have a greater forestry program. And I still have to connect him with uh, Indonesia, Australia, that just started a new ID on mangrove uh, restoration. And so, that's, uh, so they have to, but that might be difficult to connect with Africa, I'm not sure. I think mean, to change the political situation that's allowing the Amazon to get destroyed is. Uh, an important issue and if people power and wants to grow in a global organization they need to do it organically a plant grows by dividing the cells divide so if we grow like a tree we branch out we sprout out how do we do that by networking as as Thies was saying networking growing a network means sprouting a branch a twig Dividing, you just you simply add a friend. If you add a friend to the network, you've divided, and it grows linearly like that. Linear, linearly, but if you add two people, it grows exponentially, like a plant, like a tree. It keeps continuing. Though the agreement you have, you pass that agreement on to the two people you add, and that's. Uh, if they accept the agreement, they will pass it on too. And it'll, the next thing you know, you'll have millions of people in your network. Over. And political power, you'll shake, they'll be shaking in their boots. Over. So I do feel a block. Not surprisingly, it's uh, you and me, Doug. <laughs> it's not personal. I'm just trying to figure out why it's difficult to understand the value of a collective, the impact of a collective. I have no disagreement with you about what you say about individual autonomy, power, influence, impact, all of that. That is all true. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't even be here yet. But I also fail to understand why it's so difficult to understand that if you and I make an agreement, that there is a we. And no, it doesn't have to come with any of the you know, old industrial frame, you know, trappings of penalties and, you know, contracts and restrictions and all that, okay? Uh, please free yourself from the inner lawyer, okay? And just understand that the word we can be used in a lot of different contexts. And when there is a we, such as, and you even mentioned it, a Manhattan Project kind of a we. You can argue about the uh, objective, but they certainly made an impact. They had a global impact. So there are agreements, there are collective uh, agreements that can have uh, very significant impacts. And I doubt that you would disagree that each of them working on their own could have accomplished that. I don't, I would argue that they could not have working on their own. There needed to be an Edward Teller, you know, in that particular model. There needed to be, you know, 
those individuals, there needed to be an Einstein, there needed to be, you know, each person doing what they meshed together to actually create bigger impact than they could have individually. So I struggle with this seeming abhorrence of using the word we in that context. Over. When the we has all of a sudden is given or endowed with its own voice, it's no longer about just collaborative endeavor. It's about projection of that voice over others. Well, what if that was made in agreement among the, the members? What, what's made in agreement by the that members? That, voice, that that voice was actually agreed upon by the members. It's still about projection. Why? That's, that's you. I think that's your projection, Doug. Well, I, you know, I have rarely run into a conversation in a context of a collaboration or a group where the minute somebody starts talking about we and us, my response is, what do you mean us pale face? Like, who the fuck are you to talk for me? It's a projection. What if you made that agreement? I made an agreement that somebody else was going to speak for me? No, that they actually had a clarification on something that you and that person agreed upon, and therefore they can actually speak as though you had that agreement. Who are they speaking to? Anyone. For example, let's say you and I decide that part of what the GCC is, we are a group of people who converse on a Sunday morning. And now anybody here, Stacia, Alex, Tees, can go and talk to anybody and say, GCC is a group that actually gets together at this particular time on a Sunday and has a conversation. It's something that GCC does. It's not what GCC is. And there's a huge, That's there's a huge, no, it's a huge semantic Grand Canyon of a difference. People speak like that all the time, Doug. I understand that. That's my issue. <laughs> that well, people, that people, speaking, people speaking from that are projecting and assuming and presuming on all sorts of other people that they're including or asserting to include that they have not gotten a center permission from. Well, quite the contrary, quite the contrary. They could care less about anybody giving them permission. Because they're much more interested in projecting so their own beliefs. like to bring things down to earth, right? So do you actually have an, an objection if, let's say, Kayla were to go and talk to her friends and say, GCC has an agreement that on Saturdays and Sundays they get together at 11 o'clock Eastern time to actually have conversations? Would you have an objection? No problem with what you just said. So why is that a big deal then? I, I don't consider what you just said a big deal. Suppose she then says, well, we talk about unblocking i don't get a projection of in in that so then what about she says well we put our videos on youtube that I is don't, a really good way. i i don't have an issue but that's not projecting a we a voice of we it's describing things very different suppose i describe a thing which is a written thing that you and i have both agreed upon and someone says okay this is a thing i have no problem with that but the minute you go to we, the minute you go to we, the minute you go to we believe. So we, we think we think we we believe we think we should. I got a problem. What if those were already? <laughs> what? I don't understand why if that it was agreed, why would that be a problem? Because it's a projection on somebody who doesn't agree. See, I feel that that is your projection. my projection on who on this we. interpretation of we that you are in a sense blocking what i'm trying to do what you know gcc quote unquote is trying to do and i know you feel that when i use that word okay that you don't want to have that to happen because you think that that then takes away from your autonomy your voice 
and uh, therefore we cannot talk about a GCC of any kind. I think there are realms, you know, in the realm of what the GCC is comprised of in terms of actions, activities, things that are done by people that are part of the GCC, like the, the regular meetings, all that, that stuff is of neutral effect. That's not where I, where I have my issue. Okay, suppose my, I is, say, my issue is, my issue is when in a collaborative context and conversation and discussion, one person purports to represent or assert a position and it's not in the first person, it's in the we. And at that point, it's like, you did not ask for my permission. You didn't ask for my assent. You didn't discuss with me whether I agree for you to make that representation about all of the people, including me in this particular group. Okay. And there is a world of difference between those two contexts. And I don't have a charge around the word we, intrinsically around the word we. I have a charge around when it is used in a projective way, because that's power and control and authority over, and that's fucked up. It's of the old paradigm and why we're in the shithole the stop it nightmare that we're sitting in. And if we don't stop doing that to each other, and the minute you have a we projecting out into the world, you are doing that imposition. It is a power centered thing. Okay. I just don't yeah, believe, in, I don't believe in perpetuating that pattern of conduct, communication or behavior. So may I ask another question? The four agreements. Okay. One of us is don't take it personally. Why must you take it as an imposition on you if I'm talking to someone else, no matter what I say? Well, it's not contextually independent of what you're saying. Yeah, it is. No, it isn't. I show up here on Sundays. Yeah. We call it GCC. I can talk about my experience in that. Absolutely. Right? So why must you take offense at that? I don't. What you just described, I don't take exception to. That's all I'm doing. Okay, so I use a we. I say, we talk this way. We believe that talking unblocks. We believe that, you know, unblocking is necessary. We believe that we want to well, hear Well, you. you're beginning to tread a line. You're beginning to cross exactly. a line. Exactly. That's what you I'm just, saying. You just went to a place of representationally speaking for and on behalf. But how can that be argued? Well, I may or may not agree with exactly how you're framing or setting your those behavior lines. Three years suggests that that's true. Well, if you re make a representation that we get together every Sunday, I have it's a neutral statement. I have no problem with that. The minute we you start an... going into soft constructions of and conclusions, that's a different realm. And, and the mode of expression that has one person representing is not subjectively reflective of their belief of that if they start speaking in terms of we. Now, do things have to be absolute or do we actually speak with heuristics? I'm not, I'm not sure. In other words, must I get consent from all 1,300 individuals that have signed up to the Facebook group to say, oh, well, therefore I cannot say anything because I haven't consulted every 13 or 1,400 member of those people? Or can I say, generally, throughout three years, this is my observation. This is how the behavior has been you know, observed. These are you know, rational observations that we could actually then communicate to each other. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna I'm going to go to a different place, but go ahead, Alex. I, I think some of us have a, an ability to swap the word we for some of us, because some of us have an agreement. You can't say we have an agreement if some people in the room are new people who just arrived. They haven't, they haven't, they've not made any agreement with anyone. Right. They just turned up to see what the show is about. Right. So when you say we have an agreement, who are you talking to? It's better so to say some of, us, some of us. Some of us. Yeah. Say, some of us have an agreement, not we have an agreement. Well, I'm under. What I don't understand is the aversion to clarifying those agreements and actually, you know, getting them 
understood, communicated, so we can actually go on to the next agreement potentially. I just don't understand that. I think you're mixing apples and oranges, which may be the root of your confusion. Or are you? <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm very, very clear. Like, it's, it's very, very clear for me. So... In what way, let me ask you this. In what context is an agreement useful? In what context is... An agreement... It's not a question of whether it's useful or not. Agreements are meeting of the minds, assent to a commonly shared and held understanding, arrangement, negotiation, whatever. That's what an agreement is. Sure. I, I subscribe to that. Okay. So I have Tell no me. aversion to people agreeing to do things by in between themselves or to do things in a particular way, right. the same way or whatever. I, right. I have no issue with that. Right. So suppose just I just ha I just have an issue when all of a sudden one of them starts going everybody the other six people that are in that gathering you know is subject to this agreement when did that happen okay so let me <laughs> how I'm trying to get around this okay okay because of the aversion to making an explicit agreement. Whoa, 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 stop. I do not have an aversion to people wait, making has an been, agreement. It's been observed for three years, okay? So I have proposed, therefore, that there be a RFC or a how-to or kind of an opt-out kind of a protocol where we can circulate something that says, this sounds like it's something that I would like to see some resonance with. Please comment. Please give me some feedback. Please, you know, so that we can actually refine it so that it becomes acceptable to you. And because it isn't clear, because we don't charge membership fees, we don't give badges, we don't do secret handshakes, we don't do passwords, you know, we have to sort of see who's dynamic in this environment, okay? So in that, we then say, okay, after two weeks or three weeks or four weeks or whatever the time period is, if you've not explicitly stated an, an objection to what it is, may we then proceed with the particular proposal that was being considered. And oh, by the way, this is how the internet got created by exactly this protocol. Okay. So what I'm saying is what worked for the internet in a dynamic community where agreements did have to be made, where things did have to work, this protocol did work. And so I'm proposing that as a protocol so that if you really have an objection, you can actually come and say, I'm not party to this. But unless you do that in a timely way, let's proceed. That's all I'm trying to suggest. And that seems to be met with. Well, the, the, the translation of that, okay. right. The, the translation of that is silence is acceptance. In, in a way, yes. Yes. Right. So, because inactivity is basically, you know, an abstention. Yes. So, yeah. So I, I just want you to get. I get that. That the That's minute, the minute, the minute somebody has been deemed to have accepted something by their silence, that is a projection in position on them <coughs> that may or may not be true. No, but that is, <coughs> that is a proposal and, in and of itself. No, wait, hold on a second. Hold on. I want you to get that, that that is a projection, projection on assumption on somebody that may or may not be true. If there is then extrapolated beyond that, because I said that was the way it was going to work, I now get to go proceed as if that's true. No, because for everybody is something. where the projection becomes toxic for me. There's other possibilities, you know, there's variables. Some people who have different <coughs> amounts of input to contribute, and that's a variable. So their agreement can be variable too. They might have several different options they want to contribute to the agreement. So the variation to. All I'm we saying can make it worked to create the internet. I, I, Sam, I, I'm not, everything in the past, in the rear view mirror, 
is in the rear view mirror and is subject to the use case, the context, the time, the place, the space, the people, That's all of the ingredients different. that resulted in something being successful or not being successful. It is a, a, a phenomena of that time, that moment in time when that happened. It has no bearing or relevance on what do we do? What do we do? What do we say? What do we proceed? How would, do we proceed? How, what, what happens today? And my position, my argument is, my argument is that what happens collaboratively by and between people is ultimately a product of each individual's choice and volition to join an effort or not join an effort, participate, not participate, contribute, okay. not contribute, in real time, moment to moment, and that that is a completely fluid and dynamic thing in fact. Now that doesn't mean lots of people don't sign lots of agreements and purport to subscribe to lots of statements of collective whatever, when in fact they don't buy it, they don't believe it, they're not in agreement with it. And every day they go into a job at a company with a mission statement and whatever that they are violating. And some of them proactively because they're rebelling against the imposition on them. It's a toxic dynamic of power control and authority. Think you're using your experience and you're projecting that onto what I'm trying to describe as an agreement, okay? I'm, I'm trying to describe the reality of what happens in the world that's, in, that's the the, in the name of, in the name of projective that's authority. I'm doing this for us, okay? That's the excuse. Yeah, but no, no, no. Your, your projection is that it's i'm doing this for us no i'm doing this but for if people me. don't subscribe if people don't subscribe to your agreements time, time out just for a second hey yeah. you guys want to go in a room and have two people Please let us go this room. Oh, okay go ahead enjoy i'm letting you go what i'm hearing is that if I want to collaborate with a few people and that few exist in this particular community, that I have to go somewhere else to do that because this community does not allow it and does not like it. And now I'm feeling that you're speaking for the community and you're doing exactly what you said you didn't want to do. I'm, I'm not projecting my feelings about this on anybody. Yeah, you are, because I'm saying this is what I want to do, and you're the one that's speaking up saying no. I, I, I haven't heard you talk about something specific that you want to do. Exactly. I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying to you. About RCs, about uh, how-tos, about proposals. About and, I'm, and I'm saying all of that, in fact, in reality, either happens or doesn't as a function and product of individual consent of others. Right. And if you find, if you find a group of people that consent, then you're gonna be able to proceed with all of those things and those things are gonna happen. And I have no horse in that race, but that's not an expression of any we related to the GCC. It's a, it's a sprout within that container but it doesn't equal the GCC and it's may or may not be something that I'm involved with. I don't, I don't purport, I don't purport to project or assert any authority over you that says you can't do that or that other people can't join you in that exercise. Yeah, the, the GCC is a big place and Bob is Saturday night. Barn That's raising, really. barn raising was was a reflection of a desire to stand something up, and yeah, well, you, and you did that. And I never said you can't do that. Thou shalt not do that. Things are sprouting from that. Yeah, the C O the C O I sprouted from the barn raising. Yeah, I'm not arguing that it's not happening. I'm just saying that where it may happen elsewhere, it feels blocked. Well, I've, I've never had anybody, you know, step up, step in with whatever they want to do and said no to anybody. I just have a problem if somebody purports to speak for me. That I have a problem with, in general, always. <laughs> okay, sorry, Josh, you wanted to say something? 
Yeah, I guess I came in the wrong. I just, I was going to say exactly what you said right after I went away. You said exactly what I wanted to say, Sam. So, to, to be clear, is um, you guys have been doing this forever, and it's just, to, it's so, I'll just speak my truth if you guys don't mind. I'm going to do a Sunday unblocking. It's mm -hmm. fucking annoying for two people to talk about what other people talk about in front of other people and not actually ask the other people and stop. What do you guys want to do? I know what I want to do. I'm Doug. I know what I want to do. I'm Sam. Hey, Alex, what do you want to do? Okay, I know what I want to do. I'm Alex. Like, just go around the room and ask all the people in the room what they want to do and let them do it and stop acting like we don't want to have power over, but I do want to tell you my opinion on how power works i don't know how power works you don't know how nobody knows if we just let go of this discussion i think we'd be great that's my sunday unblocking because just stop it you guys already are so crystal clear it's been so many years i've been watching it i watched colin for a year well what's doug gonna figure out i don't know do you think tammy will agree to it maybe but sam might not let's put them all three in a room it's not the gcc isn't you three anymore that's the beautiful thing and i think that's what the three of you wanted because you're the three that put in the most effort in the beginning and continue to put in the most effort that is crystal clear in the gcc but if other people want to put in that effort you guys have been so inclusive saying come on in gertrude if you want to stand up a friday do it sam if you want to allow other people to take over your saturday meeting for 90 minutes go ahead i mean it's great it's be everything's beautiful that's all i wanted to say sorry that's my little rant is just there's no arguing over power because we have no one sees the power when someone seizes the power let's argue until that point let's just not argue thank you for letting me speak i appreciate it <laughs> i still feel a block <laughs> and the block is this notion of agreement what does agreement mean for you when you speak? You bring in that, so in that much negativity to this word agreement, Doug, that I feel I cannot even use that word around you. I, I, I listen. I'm a lawyer by training. Yes, and I'm saying agreements. Oh, agreements have been very, very good to me. I, I don't have a problem with agreements. Then I, my, my, my respectful request, okay, yeah. is to do exactly as Josh says. When I use the word agreement, please don't come up with this dialogue again i don't think this dialogue was triggered by the use of the word agreement it was triggered by a conversation about the use of the word we well <laughs> agreement are closely intertwined um maybe we can't have an agreement if we <laughs> haven't got <laughs> agreements create we's I I don't know about that. Agreements have, create agreements create all sorts of things, but I don't know that it equals a we. If it if, if it, if it equal if it equaled a we, lawyers would be out of business because they wouldn't be so fucked up so many of the time, so much of the time. Agreements are are the framework I'm just within you which to put the inner lawyer or the past lawyer aside. Okay. But, I'm glad agreements and you've got flexible agreements. What is what do you think an agreement is a representation of? It's a common understanding that enables the next step. It enables the next step. It's not meant to be punitive, not meant to be restrictive. It's meant to be clarifying. It's meant to be empowering. It's meant to be enabling. Is it required? If that's the agreement, yes. But if not, no. A common understanding does not have to be required. I can be, I understand you say this. You understand I, I believe this. That's a common understanding. And it allows us, us to move forward on something else. So what does agreement add to that? What's the piece of the puzzle that for you? That possibly clarification around terminology, around action, around decision, around timing, around responsibility that allows us to take the next step.
But, 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 but you said if you don't... You do the text, that's an agreement. But you said if there was the meeting of the minds and you don't have a, quote, agreement, that's, that's okay, too. That still works. There's still, it's still possible to take another step. Sure, absolutely. Right. But to the extent that my disappointment is likely, okay, that's the agreement to which... I mean, that's the degree to which an agreement actually holds, okay? So my thoughts around agreements and my thoughts around science, you know, science is an agreement with nature, actually, basically, okay? So my notion around agreements is that you do the best you can, and if I continually get disappointed by this person that I'm agreeing with, I'll probably, you know, veer towards making agreements with others, okay? in which I am less disappointed or in which that person is less disappointed in me, either, either case. But to the extent that my expectations are useful, are positive, are moving us forward, those are where agreements are useful. And those are where, you know, science is useful, okay? It allows us to move forward and get from place A to place B faster, potentially, you know, that's what agreements allow. And again, I am not focused on the punitive aspect. You keep going to, is it mandatory? Is it, some, you know, screw that. That's the lawyer talking, Doug. I'm talking. Well, about, you're, you're the, okay, Josh, you have your hand raised. I just, I, before I respond, I'm gonna I leave it know. open. I'm, I'm picking up, how can I be of service and help so you guys can get to an agreement or an agreement to disagree? So that's all I wanted to put up there. I'm here to help. If you, want to be, if you want to be Doug 2.0, Doug, put aside the inner lawyer. Well, you're, you're projecting that on me. I am. That's I not, am. that's not, that, that's, that was that's projected. not where, that's not where this is. Done. Because you do Hold that. on, that's not where this is coming from. This is coming from why set up for disappointment. You just said the essence of your, your focus on these agreements is so you're not disappointed or in the face of a breach, you can go find somebody else to play with. But it's carrying that into the relationship out of the box. That's life, Doug. I don't relate to that belief. That's life 1.0. Hold on. I do not agree with that belief. You don't have to. But a lot of people do. But that's an agreement, right? Exactly. Right there, there's an agreement. That's perfect. That's awesome. <laughs> and Gertrude taught in her sessions and I learned from our GCC in the Friday experiment that's been going on for four months we can stop for a second allow you guys to sit into that go around the room and see what other people heard and if that helps you guys awesome and then if you guys want to keep going it's Sunday on block and go for another hour I'm I got guests here I want to just check in with them but you guys are my close friends I've been meeting with every for a long time so I wanted to check in with you guys first before I check in with my physical guests that are here. So I'm just saying, if that's the end of it and you guys agree to disagree, cool. If not, continue away, please. And I'm complete. Thank you. I'd just Alex? like to add, when I see an agreement, I'd like to read it first. <laughs> that um, means that Agreements are dependent on the context, Trevor. Colin, I see a hand. Is that you wanting to speak? Yes, yes, it works. <laughs> I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm split today. Um, I am on camera, but I'm showing my screen as I'm just doing a little bit of mapping around Doug's world. Um, this is kind of Doug's day. Josh was right about that. Doug puts a lot of time into this. And um, there's some things I wrote down here, um, maybe three conversations. And this one on about agreements went two and 2.1, a little bit of time stamping there. We can go back and fish those gems. Really was a gem for a second when Doug and Sam agreed on agreements. But I'd like to switch off to something Sam said, because I think it really speaks to envisioning what space we're in. And this, the question is, part one is this question to Sam, and part two is an example of 
difficulty I've had defining the we in this group. For example, one of my behavioral agreements, and everybody knows it who knows me, is that I don't always want to be on camera uh, unless I got something worthwhile and important to say. But I'd still like to be able to put my hand up and say I'm here. So it's a it's a bit of a conflict that the that it's difficult to put my hand up. So what I'm doing now is I'm messaging the moderator my hands up if I don't have a camera. Because yesterday I was interrupting and things. So anyway, the hand has to go up to be spoken to. I do agree with that rule, whether I'm on camera or not. So somehow I have to virtualize a hand to say, may I speak? I think that that's a good thing here. And another thing is, is as long as I keep it under three minutes, people usually don't cut me off because I tend to speak long. I'm learning to speak less. So that's one, not being on camera. Well, what is the we that says I have to be on camera, should or shouldn't be on camera? People have their own reasons, but that's, that's their privilege. My privilege is to choose my reasons. And there is no agreement on that. The agreement is we agree to agree with what we want to do um, and be present how we want to be present. And if I hear people say, would you like to be on camera? That's okay. If I hear them saying it sarcastically, I just kind of note that, you know, this person doesn't understand me or shall I, you know, go forward with this person who's giving me grief without, you know, leaning in and giving positive criticism. So that's one. And another one is in generally when speaking about we of the group, it just drives me nuts because there's no context to attach the we to. No one context, there's multiple contexts. And, you know, I think that's kind of where modeling and, and getting into more um, detailed conversation where it's important matters. And this is one case right here. Sam feels this space is not good pod garden. What do I mean by that? It's not a good pod garden because in the PKE, we broke off from GCC to the practical knowledge ecology to try to get some stuff done. Okay. And that went swimmingly well. Uh, Lauren picked the best people that she thought would be collaborators. And there was a whole, whole bunch of people. Uh, I won't talk any more about that, but I just want to know from Sam, why can't we visualize this space in multiple ways so that you can be clear and understood like I am off camera, trying to be off camera. That's one of my space requirements. Why can't you make an agreement that this is a good place to try to do something? Like what is it that you think that makes this a bad place to try to build a pod? You have, you, cause I, I did hear you say that if you feel like you want to get anything done, you've got to build a group outside of this group. So speaking to that specifically. Okay, so first of all, I didn't say that this is a bad pod garden. I think uh, that was a misinterpretation of what I said. Okay. I'm exaggerating. Okay. And the second, yes, uh, there is a different place where we are doing barn raising kinds of things that's separate from Thursday, separate from Friday, separate from Sunday. Okay. But I think it is useful to me, at least, to pop in on at least Sundays, because I can't do it on Thursdays and Fridays, and sort of see what else is going on and where people feel blocked. And oh, by the way, the fact that we went to Saturdays to do barn raising is because the single GCC at the time uh, felt like a block to me around these terms of agreements and strategy and diction, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a solution to that. You know, we created a, a different thread, okay? But I do think that the notions that we're talking about in barn raising, and by them, I mean the fundamental things, you know, things like triggers, things like words, things like agreements, you know, they apply elsewhere. So I'm trying to figure out how does it land elsewhere, okay? And so from time to time, I'll explore that. This is an exploration, okay? And yes, I do think, yeah, you, you think you're tired of this conversation? Doug and I are tired of this conversation probably, okay? And yet, there's still more to be learned from it because I respect Doug. I want to understand more deeply why he thinks and believes the way he does. And the fact that he's asking questions of me potentially says to me he's interested in my perspective potentially as well, okay? Neither of us is trying to force their opinion on others although at times it may feel that way, but we're trying to explore. And in that exploration, hopefully comes clarity to both of us. And if that is difficult for people to hear, then Doug and I'll take it elsewhere, 
Okay. <laughs> but this is unblocking. And I did feel that if it was blocking me and potentially I blocked Doug whenever I brought, uh, bring it up. Okay. So this is a chance to be authentic, to be honest and to say, Hey, I feel a block here. That's why we go with this. And by the way, I do, I don't do this every week. Okay. I just do this from time to time, just to make sure you guys know that uh, it's still hanging in the air. <laughs> yeah. can, I, can I jump in here and say hold on Alex Josh had his hand up I saw the teeth go ahead Alex go ahead, Alex. Go ahead. We, we have the barn racing for the agreements once a week so what we do on Thursday night may be an opportunity for sprouting too that Sunday is unblocking and if the people attending unblocking don't come to the barn raising, they haven't got any input there on what's happening at the barn raising. Really, it's a matter of what you, where your interests lie. Over. Go ahead, Tyson. Tis, did you want to say something or can I go? Okay. There's another reason I, I do. Up. You had your, yeah, Josh. Josh had his hand up. I appreciate it. Um, what Alex was saying is actually very poignant. And um, the four different meetings for the GCC is what gets confusing because it starts to silo into, okay, well, here's what's going on on Sunday, leaving disregarding what happened on Thursday. And if you don't attend all four, it doesn't work. I think that's something we haven't really agreed that um, in the communication aspect of conversations, that when we're discussing and arguing something that we were not a part of, it's very difficult, especially if there's four different meetings per week and Sunday is the end of the week and then we're resetting the clock on Thursday. And how we reset that clock on Thursday and continue wow. to go. Who was that? Sorry, that was uh, something. Alexa. Oh, okay. Uh, well, if Alexa doesn't agree, I'm really concerned too. Because the <laughs> AI is not moving forward. But um, just agreeing that we're gonna silo those spaces and then stopping and saying on Thursday, we agree that it's open. On Friday, we agree that it's whoever's having the experiment that we're going to either participate or not. And then on Saturday, um, what I'm hearing is two of the people that stood up this GCC aren't attending each other's meetings. And, and then that might be just because of life. It's not something personal, but that could be a problem. And there was that coherence, I believe, in the beginning, meaning I remember everyone attending pretty much every meeting and continuing to bring more people in. But I think what's coming up right now is as more people come in, is it a rule that you need to attend all four? And that's an agreement I'd like to talk about on another Sunday blocking is do you need to attend all four? And if not, that's what I heard when I popped in the call this morning is Doug saying, if you're not attending those four meetings, your non-attendance is not complicit in what happens moving forward. Meaning if people vote by not being there that's not a vote they just weren't there and that's that is the dangerous part that I heard Doug say and then I heard Sam say well we can't force anyone to attend a meeting unless we agree that they have to be there so how do we move forward without asking someone to have to be there and that to me is the conundrum is that what I'm hearing you say Alex uh, I'm complete Well, to a certain extent it is, but there's a way around it. And that is if you have a machine language learning ability, AI can count the metadata. Um, you're measuring the number of people who have attended, what, how long they spent at each meeting each week. And at the end of the year, you've got the top 10 meeting, top 10 members who contributed the most to the discussion and agreements. Over. 
See, Josh, to me, the implication that you have to attend all four, that's news to me. I never thought that that was a necessity and uh, was quite upfront very early about the fact that I do have a day gig and cannot go to Thursdays and Fridays. And by the way, I do make a point of attending as many unblockings as I can to do that cross-pollination. Um, so yeah, that's, that's news to me. Yeah, I didn't have yeah, that understanding either. I, I, um, and my absence on Saturdays is just, you know, three out of four is, is my capacity and Saturday is owned by my wife. And, <laughs> and so I just, it's, it's just impossible um, to add it to the list and not risk my marriage and or my physical safety. So, <laughs> I got a potential idea. It could be failure, but um, if you smashed all four meetings into one meeting, meaning the first half an hour is open discussion, the second half an hour is an experiment, the next half an hour is a barn raising, and then the last half an hour is unblocking, and then forking off all those half an hours into mm -hmm. separate meetings, from one to attend a two hour Saturday, then they can make that agreement on each meeting to say, hey, I'll be there at this time. And then we would split and fork into two meetings where one is the two hour one and one is the half an hour one. And then people can attend the new people. So this allows for more people to come into the space is the new people can come and have the half an hour, half an hour, half an hour. But if they decide to go more, the next Saturday, they don't have to go to just that half an hour. They can go to the Saturday barn raising for two hours and the new people can stand up their half an hour Saturday barn raising and thus sprouts can continue and it can grow. That's just an idea that uh, could be very useful in the fact that a two hour barn raising is tough for a new person coming in, but a half an hour barn raising on a Thursday gives enough context for someone to decide, oh, I'd like to go to a two hour barn raising on Saturday. And a Sunday unblocking, if there was an unblocking at the end of the meeting on Thursday for a half an hour and it just is barely getting started, well, I'd like to attend Doug's two hour unblocking because I don't feel unblocked in that last half an hour on Thursday. And then if you did it again on Friday, every person that comes in that's new, it is new because it's only a half an hour, but they, can go to the Sunday one or go to the Thursday open discussion for two hours if they want to. So just the thing that I'm proposing is forking it off into two separate GCC meetings at the same time. One is for new people coming in half an hour, half an hour, half an hour. And the older people that have been here for a few years can take turns being the host and the facilitator for those half an hour, half an hour, half an hour, new people type meetings while at the same time the other meeting is going on so what's really cool i've been doing this in zoom sessions is you can have the link right there in the chat to pop back over to the two hour one so you get to attend two different meetings and it doesn't change our flow um, just putting that out there as a potential is that like having a small tent near the entrance before you get to the main tent maybe But Josh, it would be helpful. Oh, go ahead, Sam. If you think it would be help, go ahead, by all means. Set it up. Let's see how it works. Yeah, let me um, get some bandwidth to do that. Uh, if you can give me a week or so. Yeah. Um, the other thing, I said I was going to take down the GCC website. I never took it down, Sam. I still haven't had a chance to talk to you about this for almost a year. Um, the server got taken down. Uh, I mean, sorry, the server is still there. It's up, but the domain name got taken down. So it's not going to the server. So, uh, yeah, Let I'd like to have a Let me look into that. Stand that up outside of Facebook, but I'm happy to do it on Facebook first and then stand it up on some sort of place that's independent of Facebook. So we're not tied into Facebook. Usually I get notifications about domains expiring and I thought I had it on automatic, but uh, let me go double check that. Okay. 
And at some point I did, I think it was a year and a half ago, I created a Gmail account called Global Challenges Collaboration at Gmail with the intention of sharing that with the group. So there could be one email that goes, gets forwarded to whoever's standing that up at that moment that would allow for that type of structure to happen. And maybe, maybe it's time to grow past Facebook too, because Facebook just in the last three years has become quite the cesspool of crap. And then also, uh, I, I would venture to say this, I'm doing with several other groups I'm in, is moving away from Zoom because of the control that Zoom makes us have, where Doug has to make sure that Sam turns on the Zoom and then records it, and then the recording goes to Sam. It'd be nice to get that independent so that that can flow a little bit more. And one of the ways to do that is a meeting room that's independent of anyone. Um, I know Google just made an alternative to Zoom called Google Meet. So if you go to your Gmail account, it's been popping up saying learn Google Meet. The, meet, the difference between a meet room and a Zoom room is you don't have to be the owner to pop in. And um, the only problem I see with that is we could get Zoom bombed, if you will, in a Google Meet group but it would be up to the facilitator to manage that at that point. And so- Where do uh, the recordings go and who gets charged for the space? Yeah, the other thing, uh, the recordings could go directly to a YouTube account because it's Google. So therefore that would take away the, I've got to record on my computer then upload it to this space. It can go directly to a YouTube account that's owned by the GCC, meaning we all share that Gmail account and thus we can go in there and say public, private, or just don't post. It, it gets recorded, but you don't actually post it. And then you can also turn it off and on during those meetings as well. So I would have to write all these things down and stand these things up, but th those are the challenges that I see is no one has the control over the recording. Because right now Sam has the control of the recording and we all trust you, Sam, to do, do good by the group but it'd be nice to not have to have, I would like to have a GCC where we don't have to trust each other because the systems allow for the trust not to be there because nobody owns the system, which is why I keep proposing a trust, like Luke, an actual love, trust. Have to pay all the, uh, the Zoom and the uh, Google Drive charges, you know? So yeah, I'm always love, looking at all these things. I'd love to help you with that, Sam. Like I would love, I'd, don't have the bandwidth up here at the mountains, but I will go into the city if I have to, to make that stand up. Okay. Uh, so thanks for that. Let me touch on one more reason why I like having this discussion with Doug. Okay, it may not be intuitive, okay? I believe that what Doug and I are doing is we are disagreeing, but I hope we're trying to do it well. In other words, we're not, attacking each other personally. We're really leaning into this, you know, understanding. We're trying to figure this out. And that's one of the reasons I, I do this from time to time. Uh, I am not going to say that I will always do it well. In fact, I probably haven't, okay? Borderline today, okay? <laughs> but the intent is to try and disagree well and to know that we can have these things and still, you know, not be uh, full of negativity, but full of curiosity over. And, yeah. and I was just gonna say, the really beautiful thing that you stood up on Saturdays is a poll to ask the people at the end of the meeting, how did it go? And I haven't heard from Joss Winder yet, and I barely heard from Colin, and I don't know if Tice has anything else to say, but I would like to, allow you to have feedback on your conversational style to know if you're doing it well from other people because I would put in the poll, yeah, you guys are doing amazingly well. Not only that, I'm proud of you guys. I've asked my friends to come and watch because it's so amazing how well you guys are doing it versus conversations I'm in outside of the GCC that don't go not even a fourth as well. <laughs> so I think in, if I was to say in the poll, 100% you're doing it great. And I'm complete. Yeah. So for me, it it's this is absolutely the place and an opportunity, and um, whatever 
whatever you call the the dynamic and the flow between Sam and I around this stuff, um, it's all in service to practice and learning and getting to a common understanding and parsing and unpacking and teasing out what is at the root of the perception of a disagreement. I'm not sure that we actually have one, but I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in knowing what some of the drivers are behind the dimension of some of these terms and contexts that you experience me as adverse to or pushing back against because i'm not internally aware of that being what's going on for me like that's not the dynamic i'm experiencing from the inside out um but clearly that's what you're receiving i'm really interested in getting into and underneath that and figure out what what the it is at the core of that um because it's not you know it's not it's not a lived experience from the inside out on my end so <laughs> i'm as far as i'm concerned we could we could do that you know to the exclusion of everything else until resolved um you know going forward in sunday and blocking sessions like the old deep dives um you know and and getting it handled uh, in terms of both of us getting to a place of ah uh, so like got that got that um and and we're both good and move on from a place of sort of completely reciprocal shared mutual appreciation understanding uh and and dare i say agreement um <laughs> if if in fact there's a difference for us to agree to <laughs> <laughs> one more note on that even if we do and i think we have in the past make agreements these conversations will recur if we don't have that shared global memory shared should i say even group memory <laughs> because if you or i forget at one point or you know somebody else doesn't understand having come late then uh, without that shared memory, we just get these repeating uh, conversations uh, cycles again. So the importance of shared group memory to me has always been paramount. It's insane if we don't. We keep doing the same thing over and over and over. So, so we are at top of hour. This has been, at least experientially for me, fast like really fast. So that means I was having a good time. Um, <laughs> um, but I do have to go. I do have to go and, and clean up after wrestling with trying to get geometric shaped cabinetry into the asymmetries of a manufactured home in which nothing is square, no dimensions are true, and no walls are parallel. <laughs> Culinary space. <laughs> it's uh yeah it's a real treat so um if there are i can either pass back hosting or if you guys want to continue and hang on and hang out um or i can call it a wrap do we have a consensus on that tisa's saying thanks alex is saying enough jazz is saying thumbs up i assume that's to wrapping to wrapping um so uh, yeah everybody i think is ready to be done um have a, a terrific remainder of your sunday alex monday and uh maybe we'll pick that one up with us before, <laughs> before you end it i just have one last thing to say is my two friends are very interested in what colin's mapping is we spent an hour talking about colin's mapping yesterday and uh what we came up with was it might not be exactly what the GCC is, but it'd be fun to see it through the eyes of Colin. So I would like to be able to show that to new people that come in because they're fascinated. They really were like, whoa, what is that? Oh my gosh, I want to read that. Wait, it went too fast. Hold, how do I get my hands on that thing? So I just want to signal to you, Colin, if uh, 
there's little gems on the map that you've been creating and you want to give those to new people and just put a little disclaimer, this is not the GCC, this is the way I've been perceiving it for two years of mapping it, that would be awesome because that would really help new people. I just want to put I'll that out there. Don't speak for Doug or me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is, there, there is a, yeah, thanks Josh. I think there is opportunity to discuss how we can, uh, you know, go over our archived and current material. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things. And yeah, it is just a highlighting, uh, you know, work in progress, highlighting different things. So it's quite, quite random. But yeah, it is interesting and it is a different perspective. And you're right in identifying that it's mostly mine, which is, you know, and, to Sam's lament. And you showed, you showed the Trello board yesterday and they were fascinated by that. So that was everybody's. So there's a lot, a lot of shared archive knowledge that we've created. Sam has Google Docs up the yin yang on Facebook. And I know there's been a lot of people like even Charles Blass has bounced it in and out. And I've talked to him on other communities and he's like, what the fuck are you guys doing in the GCC? And I'm like, <laughs> well, why don't you show up in meetings again? Come on, Charles. So he's been showing up to barn raising, but he hasn't been in, in any of the other meetings. And he's judging it all on barn raising. And I'm like, come on, Charles, that's not fair. That's just not fair. And I know other people that have bounced in and out that judge it on one particular meeting. And that's not fair either. So I think we can do better and not be bitter. I'm <laughs> no bitterness here. Okay, gentlemen, think, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Alex. I think we have an agreement. But um, I have an agreement. I don't know what we have. Some of us have an agreement. And it's a matter of uh, being on, on topic too. So that's one of the issues, but that's for another time. Oh, okay, folks. Thank you, thank you. See you next week. Bye for now. Bye.